All righty guys, today we're sitting down with Mick Sinclair. For those that have been around the motocross industry, you'll definitely know who Mick is. How are you, mate? Going good, thanks, mate. It's, um, yeah, it's great to connect with you again. It's been a long time and uh, I was stoked that you just did get that message from you and you're here in my house today and we'll have a good chat. Yeah, mate, for sure. So, so to give a bit of a context to our history, I raced the MX Nationals in 2012, self-confessed nobody, old bike, second-hand bike, old gear. I was around Matt Moss's old gear. Didn't do too bad. I was sort of like fifth, whatever, whatever. I couldn't have Barabran, I did a little bit better. And then I got a call from you and you offered me my first ever sponsorship. Like yep. literally my first ever sponsorship with Fox. And it's a memory that's really stuck in my mind because I always say, you don't remember what people say, you remember how they made you feel. And you were very accommodating, you were over the top. And, and that for me was, um, that was awesome. So that's gone back quite a way. It is, a long time ago. That's that, 13 years almost, so 12 years now. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I didn't remember Kuna Barabran. I remember Broadford quite clearly. Right. And it must have been the round after Kuna Barabran because you went out and won. Yeah. Yeah, correct. I had my first ever race win, yeah. So that must have been the first race that we gave you gear for. Yep. Does that sound right? It was, yeah. So I think we did Broadford was round one. I didn't do too bad. That might have been where you first approached. Okay. And then Kuna Barabran, I qualified first for the first time ever. Might have won one race. Kuna Barabran was cool. That was cool. What ever happened to that place? I think it's just in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> that made it fucking, that was a long way to go. If that place was in Melbourne, it'd be it in a bit. Yeah, but, for sure. Yeah. So a little bit of your history. Studied mm. RMIT, athlete manager for Fox, yep. Shift, Oakley, Pod, Arnett. You worked at Harley Heaven. You started Shred Bike. Yeah. You're now at AME Management. Yep. Yeah, I've um, been really fortunate enough to work with some cool brands and um, some really cool people, some cool athletes along the way. Um, I actually forgot about Arnett until you mentioned that. That, that was a cool brand to work with for a little while um, through Oakley. But yeah, pretty fortunate, pretty, you know, I would say lucky, but you make your own luck, don't you? And, um, you know, I didn't, wasn't a, a high achiever at school. I left school at the end of year nine and I was always going to be a plumber. Yep. Uh, working for dad in his plumbing business and did my apprenticeship when I was 15 and finished that when I was 19 and did not want to be a plumber for the rest of my life. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a long story. Um, so it depends on how much time we have, but it's a pretty cool one. You know, I went and worked for Konski Full Throttle Sports. Yep. Um, working on his Thumping Hats events, you know, putting out bunting and putting up signs and helping Cam set up his freestyle ramp and taking entries and doing all that kind of shit. Like I was, you know, 500 buck a week kind of gig. Um, and from there, um, we ran a freestyle event in Tassie uh, called FMX Unleash. And that's where I met Trevor Brooks. Yeah. Brooks, he's a track builder of all the the supercrosses, does all the nitro courses. And he got me a gig on Krusty Tour, building tracks, um, or build, helping building the course, bolt and ramps and shit together. And, yep. and then from there, that's where I met Scotty Runciman. And at that time, Scotty was the product manager for Fox. Um, I know we connected, we just gelled. And I guess I always had a bit of a marketing head on me, even through you know early days of high school when Cam and I were racing and we, I'd write all our own, and do all our own sponsorship deals and we'd do all right out of it. Um, so I just had a knack for it. And yeah, I met Scotty through Krusty um, and he brought me over to Monza when I was 23. Well, wow. And yeah, I, was, I actually started as his assistant and they didn't, as a product manager's role back then, you looked after your own marketing. There was no such thing as a marketing manager. Like every product manager looked after their own. Gotcha. There was no social back then. I mean, well, there may have been, but brands weren't utilizing it. And uh, yeah, I kind of created a marketing role there and moved away from Scotty's assistant, you know, around 25-ish. Um, created that athlete manager role, which would take me to all the events and, and kind of stepped it up. And I really took inspiration for what they were doing in the US. Yeah. Um, Beaker was at Fox and he was doing a great job with it. And I just wanted to be like that guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my mind back then as a 24-year-old kid with, a, with an ego working with some big brands, um, I just wanted that that guy's job, so I kind of created it here. And John Kyoto was really good about it. Um, Scotty was really good about it, and yeah, it just kind of went from there. And that's kind of how I elevated my senior seniority. I can't even say that word um, within Monza, and, and yeah, I was there for ten years in the end. 
Um, yeah, well, you really blossomed in that role because, yeah, you're right. In America, they have Beaks with Fox and mm-hmm. at one stars has a guy and yeah. every other Everyone company did, has yeah. like a brand guy. But in Australia, there was really no one you'd sort of, there was just brands and that was it. Pretty much. You pretty well set the standard for that and I don't think anyone's really done it like you have since. Uh, there was a few others, like Joel Ryan was out there doing it with Scott. That's um, right. Yep. Um, and I mean, after me at Fox, Jimmy did it for a while and I'm sure there's been a few others come and go, but... Yeah, I think it's changed a lot since then too. I think it tightened up a bit since then. So I don't think there's anyone else out there doing what we used to do. They might go to a few events here and there. So yeah, like to give context, you're going to every single national event all year long. You're in the office during the week. You're dealing with the athletes. You're dealing with the products. You're doing... Yeah, but also had to consider at that time, Fox was getting really big into surf. Yep. Uh, we're into mountain bikes. Uh, we had... BMX racing, BMX freestyle. BMX freestyle is probably one of the biggest pushes we did, So and wake. So it was a great gig for a guy who was, who'd be single and have no kids. Um, but I had a wife, um, and then Hudson come along. He's 13 now, but nothing really changed when he first come along. Like, it was just uh, business as usual. I'd go to the races. It all changed for me when Harley came along in 2014 and it was just too much to be away every weekend having that lifestyle i had to pull my head in a bit and spend a lot more time at home and 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 i wanted to as well i mean um i have no regrets doing anything like i did with that when huds was first born no regrets whatsoever but definitely when harla come along and, and we had two kids you know under four you really needed to be around and um you need to be around anyway but I just need to be home and yeah, that was probably my time to hang it up there at Monza. It was a, uh, I left there 2016, I think. I got the opportunity to go to Harley Heaven, um, yep. which at the time was like a brother or sister company to Monza. Yep. Um, it was all within the Kyoto family and it was a really good change. I mean, I knew nothing about Harley Davidson's at all. Um, didn't really like them, but man, that brand is a brand that you can get passionate about so quickly. Yeah, the, as in Harley itself. Mm-hmm, yeah. The legacy, the heritage behind that brand, and I just turned into a Harley guy straight away. Yeah, right. Yeah, within within months, um, knew fuck all about it, but I learned about it quite quickly, and it was a brand that took me to some pretty cool places. I traveled, you know, around the world with that, um, you know, often, went to some pretty cool places some cool sh- cool events um, and I really enjoyed my time there and I ended up being there for eight years and that eight years in my life was the f- fucking quickest eight years I've ever had. Yeah, like wow. it just flew. They say time flies when you're having fun and I'd say for the first six years I had a lot of fun. The last couple of years I got really bored. Um, there wasn't a lot of competition for Harley and we just need, we didn't need to do anything out of the ordinary. We didn't have to get creative everything we did just worked and it, we didn't have to change anything. Yeah. So I really got set in my ways there. Lost, felt like I lost a bit of creativity for a while. Felt like I lost a little bit of drive in those last couple of years. Um, and you know, to be honest, I wasn't looking at going anywhere, um, but I got an opportunity and I was talking with Santa Cruz Bikes. Yep. Um, we're, we're right into the mountain bike space. My son races downhill and, and you know, it's a huge part of our life now. So it was pretty um, enticing to get a, get a gig at Santa Cruz. And I asked Bailey for a reference because uh, it was pretty much all but done, this deal, kind of. Um, they needed some references from the, from the guys in the US and hit up Bailey for a reference. He said, no worries. And then a couple of hours later, he's like, nah, why don't you come and work with AME? Gotcha. Um, Bailey's not at AME anymore. He obviously is on the SS Global side of things they're two separate businesses so they're separate yeah completely gotcha. separate um but bailey's wife callie is our managing director at amy and uh yeah from there uh didn't take long to make the, the deal happen and now i'm at ame and, and i love it man like i actually feel like i'm back where i belong like this i didn't realize how much i miss this space motocross supercross the athletes that side of it until i've come back and feel like I've really landed on my feet again here, working alongside the AME team. We're only a small team. I say small but mighty, but man, uh, it's a, a room full of very smart people um, who are very passionate about motocross and supercross, and we're going to make a difference. Yep. I mean, I feel like 
Australian Supercross has a lot of momentum at the, at the moment. From the outside looking in, you know, last year we only did three rounds and it doesn't sound great, but they were three really good rounds and it was the first year that we took all of them in-house. So in 22, uh, when I was in there, the series was a, I wouldn't say it's a schmozzle because I still did a good job, but there was multiple promoters. Yep. So, and that doesn't work, man. It's like inevitably going to be. Difficult. It's hard. No one knows who to talk to. The riders don't know who to speak to. The teams, you know, who's parking trucks at this one? Who are we getting passes off at this one? It's just didn't work. The broadcast wasn't really consistent. So we brought it all in house last year and it was definitely a rebuilding year. And, um, you know, this year we've got a lot of momentum and we've got some, you know, we're only a couple of days or maybe weeks from announcing the 24 series. Yep. And um, it's really exciting. The series is growing in terms of rounds, uh, in terms of, I'd say, venues and events that we're going to run in conjunction with. Like, we've got some really cool shit happening. Yep. And then we've got the World Supercross side of it too. Obviously, World Supercross is ran by SS Global, which is uh, Adam Bailey's the CEO and part owner. Um, and AME, we contract to them and we run uh, their marketing and social gotcha. um, marketing social content um, we still help out on the floor so we're still a huge part of it yep so yeah in short that's pretty much my journey yep cool mate well i gotta say selfishly it's good to see you back in motocross yeah thanks no i'm genuinely like fucking loving it it's it's very cool you know i lost a bit of passion when i left monza for motocross and supercross and I don't know why. I think probably just burnt out. Yeah. You know, I'd been around it since I was four years old. Uh, you know, we raced since we were four. I think I stopped when I was 20-ish, maybe 24. I don't know. I made a couple of little comebacks here and there. but And then to work as much as I did and, and how intense I did in that space. Um, by the time I was out of it, I just kind of left it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I my kids... They ride a little bit, but they don't race or anything like that. I mean, you know, like I said, we're really deep within the BMX space and downhill space. Um, you know, that's what we do as a family. So they weren't really into it. And I stopped following it for a little while. Yeah. Didn't really miss it. Um, wasn't looking to come back into it. But now I'm here. Fuck, I'm glad because I absolutely love it. And I don't think I've ever been more passionate about it. Like it's, yeah. you know, it's really cool. And I'm, I'm stoked and it feels like I'm back where I belong. It's funny how you take those those trends through life. Like I've pretty much mirrored exactly yours. Like obviously in a different position, but love racing. Stepped away four or five years. Now I'm here. I'm like, this is all I think about. It's all I want to do. Yeah. I couldn't have pictured that three years ago. Yeah. But whatever it is. Yeah, I don't know. It's um, I mean, I guess I have to be passionate about it. I have to be into it now. I'm working in it. But genuinely, I feel like I'm the biggest Supercross fan there is again. Yeah. Same. Um. You know, I watch it religiously every week. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm playing fantasy leagues. I'm like, fuck, you know, this time, year, year and a half ago, I wasn't doing that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely back. I think I've got a bit of an addictive personality too. And if I'm in something, I'm in 110%. Yep, I'd certainly agree with that. Good <laughs> stuff. So I'm going to get into, I've got a few questions for you. And I want to get into the athlete promotion side mm. of things. Yeah. That's where I first know you from. And, yeah. and what I would say is, is something you're really, really good at. What is it like working with athletes? Oh, it's great. I mean, I always wanted to be an athlete. Yep. And fuck yeah, I was never good enough. Um, so I always felt like that was the next best thing. And that's what I'd go back to before when I was talking about guys like Biko. You know, yeah, they, they were working with some of the best guys in the world. And yep. I really, really um, found that interesting. And obviously being around my brother too, you know, he's been an athlete or a professional athlete since he was what, 16, 17. Yeah. Um, and I, alongside with Bailey, you know, helped, uh, you know, get him sponsorship deals. And, and I wouldn't say I managed him. I never really managed him because that was Bailey's gig, but I always advised him. This is Cam. This is Cam. Yep. So, you know, Bailey would go out and do all the deals, but I'd be the last one to look at it. Gotcha. And I really enjoyed that. Um, I enjoyed looking through contracts. I enjoyed advising Cam. Yes, he should. No, he shouldn't do that. I think he could do better. Um, and that wasn't just sponsorship deals. That was his Nitro or Krusty deals back then and then into his Nitro deals. And so I, I played, um, I wouldn't say it was a big role, but it was definitely a role yep. that I really enjoyed doing. And I was able to turn that into a career when I went to Monza and created that role. So, yeah, it's great working with athletes. I mean, sometimes they're pains in the asses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Like, 
it's not all beer and skittles. Um, yeah. Um, some of them are pricks. Some of them are assholes. Some of them are very, very, very selfish. But that's what also makes them really good. Oh, let's just get straight to it. Who was the hardest athlete to work with? Oh. <laughs> Hardest athlete to work with. Now, this is an interesting one to work with because I really do like the guy. I consider him a mate, but I find Chad really difficult to work with. Yep. Um, I never got to work with him as a, an athlete manager, but more so recently at events. Yeah, yeah. And I'll probably leave it at that. I mean, like I said, Chad's a great guy. I get along with him great. Um, but he's, you know, he, he's, he's just who he is. And, you know, Chad does everything on, on his terms. And... Uh, hey, Chad, can we go and get you to this autograph signing? Yep, no worries, but he'll do it when he's ready. And, yeah, gotcha. You know, it's probably not all him either because my, I've, got, I've got a bit of saying, if you're on time, you're late. Yeah. And Chad's on time. Gotcha. Which puts everyone under pressure. Yeah. Because if he's not on time, then we're late, and then it adds pressure. So I, I don't know. My drives, drives Christy mad. It drives the kids mad. But if, if we're on time, we're late. Yeah, they really it takes pressure off people by by by, by being organised. Yeah, and you know we'd give Chad schedules and whatever, and he would stick to them to the second. Yeah, gotcha. So I had to adapt a little bit and made sure my schedules changed a little bit, so I was always a little bit early to take pressure off stuff because I just like to be organised. Yeah. So I wouldn't say most difficult, most challenging, and it's more so in recent times. I could definitely see that dynamic between an athlete manager and an athlete. It's be here at this time, and it's. I'll be there when I'll be there. Yeah. Well, it's not, no, for the most part, they're all good. They'll be there. Yeah. But like, fucking be there. You know, like it's <laughs> not, mm, yeah, all right. Yep, cool. No worries. No, no, no. You'll be there, yeah? Yeah. Like that's a bit I kind of struggle with. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's not just with athletes. That's with team at work and my kids and my wife. It's like, you know, I just need that. Yes, this is happening at this time. Yeah. And, and, and we're going to be there on time. And by being there on time, is being there five minutes early for me. And now maybe to switch to the other side of the coin, or maybe not, you recently went to America mm-hmm. to do a bit of work with the Lawrences. Yeah. And you had a relationship there through yep. the clothing. So yeah, that was really cool. Um, so at AME, we um, work with Jet and Hunter on their clothing brands. They've both got a merch range, um, Jetson.co and Hunter.co. So we run that program from start to finish, design, um, sourcing, printing, dispatch, order taking, like from right. start to finish, it's cool. I mean, yep. I actually don't have a lot to do with it in terms of that side. I help with a little bit of marketing. Um, Alice uh, in our office, she's an absolute gun. They're her brands. Um, we call them her brands. Cause her she, brands. She, she looks after them from start to finish. Yep. And she does an amazing job with it. Um, and I, I throw my two cents in, two cents in when they need me to. Yeah. Um, the shoot in in Huntington Beach a couple of weeks ago kind of all went to shit for us a little bit. It was the week when um, everything went down between Jet and Jason. I did notice that. Yeah. So we our days got moved. Uh, plus it rained in California that week, so the tracks were wet. So it moved our shoot days around a little bit and location. So. Um, I come up with a location on the fly and pretty much directed that shoot from start to finish with um, some some filmers and some shooters over there. But it was a lot of fun. Um, it was really good to connect with with the boys again. Yep. I haven't seen those two boys for a long time. I mean, they haven't even been home. I think they've been home once, he said, since I went to Europe. Um, it was quite funny. We went to the test track on the Thursday and we, we were doing the shoot with them on Friday and... and Everything we do through for them is via their agent through Myrtle. We don't have any, well, we didn't have any direct contact with the boys. I've always, yeah, like selfishly personally wondered how much are they involved in the marketing side of it or are they just purely trained, that's it, yeah. Myrtle hand, um, everything else. Yeah, so everything we do is through, was through Myrtle. Anyway, we went out to the test track just to watch and we didn't bother them at all. We kind of stood outside the fence and, uh, and watched them uh, test that day. We caught up with him on the Friday. Hunter rocked up to the test and goes, "Hey Mick, were you at the track on on yesterday?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Imagine being at the test track and not coming to say hello." <laughs> I mean, that was a really nice feeling. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then from there, we just reconnected again, and it was great. We spoke a lot about oh, awesome. the old times, and you know, I've got jerseys, from, you know, of his from his first national and in Murray Bridge that he won, and and it was really good to connect with Darren again. Um, they seem. Like the exact same people I knew from back then. Yeah. They haven't changed a bit. 
That's awesome. It is really cool. I think, I reckon they get kept at arm's length from a lot of people, or most people, for the right reasons too. Um, and you, you, I wouldn't have had a clue if they had it changed or not. You know, I, I would have expected them to. Yeah. But man, they were exactly the same, and it was a really nice feeling to reconnect with them again. And since then, it's like it hasn't stopped. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it, it definitely does look like that from the outside looking in. Like I'll listen to some interviews and whatnot, and it's like they're just living in their own little bubble. It's still the same. We ride, we train, we race. And yeah, I think they do. I think they're in Florida. They got Chad's old farm, and they just work. Yeah. Um, but they're just like a normal family. Jet and Hunter are still pretty close by the looks of it. You know, like they're super close in the way they banter and yep. and fuck around and that with each other at that shoot was a lot of fun. And we had a really good day. Well, that's cool because yeah, usually if you rock up to a an athlete at the place of work, they usually got to don't have time for you. Whereas... I mean, well, that's why we didn't bother them on the Thursday before. But they wanted you to. Well, yeah. th knowing that Not now, and them, and you know, I was gonna go say hello. I thought and. And Bailey was with me. He's like, you know what? Let's just leave with him. You'd hate walking, you know, being there. You, you know, you're busting your ass at work. You're sitting in your office, and people are coming in. Hey, how you going? You know, yeah, it's yeah. been a while since you've seen him, so you, you could find that really annoying. So we didn't, and it was a right move what Bailey said because even though Dazzy said, uh, sorry, Hunter said, you, you know, why didn't you come over? Dazzy said, you know, we had so many people at the track that day. You know, we're getting annoyed, we're trying to ride. So we did the right thing by steering clear, but it was definitely a nice feeling to be to be recognised by the boys again and, and, and they were genuinely stoked to, to see us. Cool. So we'll get a bit more into the marketing side of things. Without actually winning and having the results, obviously we'll sort of just push that aside. Hmm. What does a rider have to do to be as, as marketable? Like you look at a Roxon, very marketable, you look at a Jet, but then maybe you look at a little Poto and riders like that, they're not so, they're just very professional and not so big on the marketing side. What does a rider need to be more marketable in your eyes? I mean, well, we're in this YouTube era, right? Yeah. Look at what Deegan's doing and, and has for a little while and not just YouTube, but social. So obviously you've got to win. You've either got to have one of two things. You've got to be winning yep. and dominating like what RV did, like what you know Jet does. Jet doesn't have a YouTube channel. He doesn't really post a lot on social media. Um, he's got a great team around him that promotes him well. But I mean, if you're not winning races, I would be looking at a lot what Elijah Weeze does. Mm -hmm. Do you follow him? Ah, uh, yeah, I see his stuff, yeah, for sure. I think he does a great job. I mean, um, a great job at marketing him, marketing our sport. Um, I didn't know Elijah until I got to work with him this year when we went to Adelaide Supercross. And he, I mean, he was, you know, in Adelaide, it was either Medi or Elijah as a local guy to work with, and, and Medi was great too, but then he hurt his knee. So um, he was around, but not as accessible as what Elijah was, so we used Elijah a lot for PR opportunities, and you know, for a market like Adelaide, we had Chad there too, but we just needed someone, and we yep. had a local guy there being Elijah, and he did so well. And since then, I've followed him, and really studied what he does, you know, he's in India now. He got a ride in India and yeah, that's that. purely because how he markets himself. Yeah. He's got a, you know, he's got 40,000 followers on Instagram or something. And I said that to him, you know, he, I, I thanked him after Melbourne um, for the amount of effort he did for us with promoting Supercross. You know, he was the, like one of the only privateers at every press day. Yeah, right. And there's a for reason, reason for that. Yeah. Because he wanted to be there, but he worked hard for it. Once he was there, he got the content and pushed it. A lot of people complain, oh, this guy's not at, oh, I'm not at press day when this guy is, but what are you going to do? You've got to give value, yeah. For sure. And he'd done a really good job of it. And I said to him when I thanked him at the end, mate, thanks so much for everything you did. And he goes, I just wish I had better results. I said, I actually don't know how you went. And he didn't make a main. Yes. Yeah. Right? And I said, mate, it doesn't matter. You've won the hearts of so many Supercross fans. Everyone in our office loves him. Yep. And I think uh, a lot of Australian Supercross fans really like him for who he is and what he's doing. And I don't know if they'd even know what he came. Yeah. Because I didn't. I, yeah, I totally agree with that. If, if um, there's a lot, you can get results, that's one way to do it. Well, you have to do get results. Don't get me wrong. It's but important. You can also you be more, entertaining. Saying, you can also provide value in, in other ways. If you're not getting the results, there are ways around it. Yeah. Having, you know, winning races, getting results, being marketable. Uh, is great having the complete package is great but there's not a lot of them but look at Tanti and I don't get me wrong I love Tanti um, but 
Elijah's got way more followers on social media than what Tanny does. Well, probably a good one, and, and I, I don't want to seem like a slight in any way, but Joel Whiteman finished fourth or fifth. Fifth? I had no idea. Most people had no idea. And then he's in America doing like, if you took YG's personality and marketing skills and combined them with Joel's. Exactly. That's a, like, that's a, that's a yeah, star rider we've been doing the, terms. We've been doing the best we can to push Joel in the US because the local media haven't been. I, yeah. That's not true. I think Motor Online have been pushing him a little bit um, and doing a few articles and that on him here and there, but no one's really following his story. And I caught up with him when we were over there and, and I was really, you know, I'm genuinely stoked for him, but I wish they would tell that story a little bit more. Do you think the onus is a little bit on the rider to tell their story themselves? Yeah. Yeah, invest in a, invest in a camera guy to I mean, follow you, you around, you know. Use a phone these days. <laughs> it's you like can. Or invest, Joel Evans is a guy that... Invest in an editor then. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like... CapCut's I, pretty good. I know that, yeah, or CapCut, whatever, but I would definitely would be. For sure, yeah. If I was in Joel's position, I'd, I would be documenting the shit out of that thing and telling everyone about it. And I know if Elijah was in that space, you would know everything about it. For sure. And his following would grow up through the roof. But each to their own, maybe Joel doesn't give a fuck about that. I mean, it's up, it's totally up to him, you know. it's um, He rode great with Australian Supercross. You know, he won two of the three privateer payouts. And... I've known him and his old man for a long time and they're bloody lovely people. Great people. Um, so I was genuinely stoked for him um, and his dad. I know how much effort they put in. I love the time that they spent together. It was great to connect, and, you know, see them both in Anaheim, two pits. We just happened to bump into each other and we had a really good chat, both the both of them. Yeah. So I'm stoked for him. I just wish they would tell more people about what they're doing. For sure, yeah. Everything they're doing is great. It just needs to get it we get it out there. Why do you think some riders don't so much market themselves like that? Desire. Yeah. They don't want the limelight. They don't need the sponsorship. They don't, they're happy with. It kind of does suck because like you get into riding bikes to, to race and ride and then you've got this whole marketing side which can provide a job and an income for you but it's not really what you got in it to do. Yeah, so it just comes down to doing what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah like I said, it was me. I'd be all over that. Um, but I know for some others, they... They, they, they just don't, it's not on their priorities, they don't care. I'm just going to assume, say, we're just using Joel Whiteman as a random name, but say his results, his income was maybe around zero for racing. Wouldn't be too far off. Like, he'd have prize money from the rounds. He's got prize money, the privateer payout. I don't think he's got any bonuses. I'm, I've, I actually, I don't know, mate. I wouldn't have a clue. If he marketed himself like a Elijah, or even better, what do you think his potential could be? For a rider like that that's finishing 5th to 10th and they do the best marketing possible, put themselves out there, maybe they're doing merch, they're doing all the yeah. social media... What's the ceiling? Or even just like an average potential? For I don't know if they'd make a lot of money out of it though. I think they would, they would get their expenses covered though. I think, yep. you know, I think if Elijah had Joel's results, um, I don't think it'd be costing Elijah a lot to go racing. Yep. Um, and that could lead into filling rides. Yep. If someone gets hurt, which then, you know, you're getting, might be getting paid a little bit or bonuses, you know. Imagine if Joel had factory bonuses for top fives, you know, like but I don't think he would have. So the reason I bring that up is I look at America and there's a crop of riders from like 15th onwards, Logan Carnell's, your Adam Antiknaps, um, there's a whole host of them. And they're all doing really well as privateers, like um, Buttery Films, he's not a racer, so to speak, but they make a really good consistent living and it's purely just marketing. No one even knows what they finish, they're around 20th there somewhere. Yep. Yep. Do you think that would work in Australia? It's hard because it's, it's really hard. I mean, there's 300 million people in the US. Mm. We've got like 23 million, 24 million at the moment. Yeah. A supercross race in America costs the same amount of money as a supercross race to put on in Australia. And they're getting 30, 40,000 at each round. Yeah. You know, we did amazing in, in Newcastle last year. We had 17,000. Yeah. You know, per capita. That's Percentage fucking, wise, that's massive. Fucking massive, right? Yeah. But they're doing that 17 times. Last year, we did it three. This year, we might do five. The year after, we might do six. I mean, I think Australian Supercross is good for six rounds. That's the feedback we're getting from the industry. Uh, we're getting from the teams. You know, I had a really good chat with Brayton. He goes, I think six rounds is, is where it needs to be at. Yeah. And no more than that. So it's hard for these dudes to, to go and do that with six rounds, especially with our population. There's a lot more people out there that mm. can support them. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's no, no easier or no cheaper 
to run the event here because we want to run our events at the exact same level as over there, but they just get a lot more support. Yeah. And I purely think it's down to population. Yeah, I totally agree with that. If you look at any like market share, whether it's bike sales, they just replicate the population of the country and the, that's how many bikes they sell. It's just a percentage-wise yeah. all the time. So events, you would think, would be no different with a sport. What are, just to go back to what you were mentioning with Elijah, what are like three actionables that a rider could say start doing tomorrow to get on that path, marketing-wise? Yeah, just really invest in yourself. Don't be afraid to spend some money. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there get coached i mean social obviously is a big one and his social is great he's got a good following um but you know like i said we're in the youtube era right so you know you've got to be seen um i think the biggest thing is content content is king yeah have some having that person following you around pre post event you know no one's really vlogging at events in australian races yet and i'm surprised um yeah. but that that's what I would be doing, you know. I, I kind of do that with some of my kids' stuff now. We get great support through yeah. our racing, but, um, you know, they're kind of everywhere, and some people don't agree with that. But, you know, it's it's what I enjoy doing. It's I kind of do it for a living, you know. So if I can put that into what my kids do and, and we can get some support from it, then why not? But, yeah. um, you know, and I'm trying to teach my son that stuff now. You know, he has good deals, but it's like, man, you got to work for it. Yeah, absolutely, and... and- I'll speak to it on this. Like I didn't, I thought about doing these for maybe like 12 months, so to speak, didn't do it, didn't do it. I don't want to be on camera, I don't want to have talks, but I uh, finally did it. And the reaction from putting out like long form content just behind the scenes, all that sort of stuff, it's been 20 fold what I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. It's much more than say, just like a social media post here and there. It's kind of surface level. People might know about you, but not who you are. As soon as you start to do like the vlog stuff, the um, interviews, the podcast, whatever it is, it, it's like a whole nother level of, yeah. People don't just know about you, they, they invest in you. Yeah. Um, Joel Evans is another guy that does a great job in that. Yeah, I keep hearing that and to be honest, I haven't looked at a lot of what he does. I follow him on social, but for some reason I don't get served with a lot of his content. So I really got to go back um, and have a look at what he does. But I think, um, yeah, just invest in yourself, invest in, yep. in, in content um, and that would be the first one for me or probably the biggest one. It's... Yeah. I mean, you've got to be able to ride a dirt bike too, though. Don't get me wrong. You yeah, can't, for you sure. Can't, you can't not jump a triple or skim through a set of whoops and do that because then you just get caught out and look like a gook. Yeah. So you've still got to know what you're doing. You've still got to be able to ride, but to take it to that next level and be seen and be heard, you've just got to invest in yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, you always got to have the general attributes, but then if you just want to carry a camera yeah. around and show them, then there's yeah. a lot of added value in that. How do you build a brand? Ah, oh, fuck, that's a pretty big question. Isn't it? <laughs> it's a wide uh, question. Uh, a wide again, question. Um, you know, you want to make sure you've got some decent backing behind you and in investing. In saying that, you know, I started Shred with, with another guy. We had 1500 bucks each. Yep. And by no means is that, is that brand going through the roof, but um, it's trickling nicely. Yep. Um, but how do you build a brand? I mean, one, you've got to find your niche. You got to find your market, your target market, and and really learn about that, um, and and kind of stay in your lane. I would say, mm-hmm. um, focus on what you know in the area you know in. Like for me, starting a bike hair brand, I know mountain bikes, I know BMX, I know motorcycles. But imagine if I was to go and start a brand that has something to do with netball. Yeah, I wouldn't have a fucking clue. You know, like it would just wouldn't work. You gotta go so and do you've, ten year you've, grind. you've so. really got to, you know, stay in your lane and stick to something you're passionate about. I mean, that can also bite you in the ass a little bit because passion projects can can fail or, you know, um, can run out of legs a little bit. Um, but I still think you've got to be passionate about. It. You've got to love it. Yeah. Um, you've got to yeah find your niche, stay in your lane, make it look good, um, have a decent brand product whatever you're doing to start with i mean if whatever you're trying to do if your product is shit then no one's going to buy it no matter how good it looks or or they will to start with and then you'll get caught out yeah so whatever you're trying to push whether it's a person a product you got to make sure it's good yeah for sure Um, and then you got to make sure you're seen everywhere yep so expand on that one say you had a hundred thousand dollars to get yourself seen everywhere Dude, I would it. love a hundred grand to start a brand. <laughs> you said pick we, ten, pick a hundred. We, we started Shred with three grand. Yeah, and um, we we capital we we created a brand that kids wanted to use to wash their bikes. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a shit thing to do to have a washing bike. No one really likes it. We made washing bikes really cool. We, we had, the brand looked cool. Um, our liquid, you know, our wash, our degreaser, our eco clean, they're all bright colors. Um, so we made it look good to start with. Mm-hmm. And then we gave away a lot of product. Yeah. We just got everyone using it. So like sponsorships, you'd invest in? No. We just go to the local bike tracks. It's like activation, box, giving active things out. Guerrilla marketing. Yep. Yeah, we'd set up at local BMX tracks, local mountain bike trails with a tent and just give kids samples. Old school. In grind, person. full grind. Like yep. it was like, what the fuck am I doing out here on a Saturday morning giving this away, but it worked. Yep. And then obviously we're in that space. So I, th- we, I found that with a lot of kids these days too, kids are more looking at their peers on social media rather than their heroes, yep. especially in the mountain bike space. So, and I use my son, for example, you know, we love watching world cups and downhill world champs. He knows all the riders bits and pieces, but he knows what his peers are doing and what jump they're jumping. This guy's, you know, and they're all the cool kids all of a sudden you're jumping the local 40, 50 foot road gap at Red Hill. You know, every 14 year old kid wants to do that. And there's kids like that all around Australia. So we did a lot of research and found the best peers. And we gave them a shit ton of product. We gave them product to give out. So they looked like a hero. Mm -hmm. And it worked so good. And we just got that much product out there and that much reach from looking after the best kids rather than the best pros. Yep. Um, because like I said, we found that kids are really looking up to their peers more than their heroes these days right? because of social media. Gotcha. So are you doing the in-person stuff to then get them on the social media promotion or you just doing, could you go purely social media or you have to do the in-person? Oh, you could just do content. Like if, if you had the money to spend, where would you, oh, where man. would the effort go? Well, you would have there are, oh, sorry. I'll, there are some brands that will just do paid ads. Purely, and as long as they see a X amount of return on per paid ad, that's yeah. all they'll do. Yeah. There's others that'll go to every ride park or every event, do it in person. With a hundred grand, you could do all of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's <laughs> let's make it a thousand. <laughs> um, uh, it's a lot of money to start a brand, and I yeah, like I said, would you sponsor top riders? Obviously, you mentioned the peers. Um, yeah. So again, if I had to do it again, it it also depends what brand you got or what product you've got. Yeah. And it goes. It's a hard one to answer because. Who are we targeting? What niche is it? Yeah. it? It's a it's really difficult to answer until you got that shit figured out. Mm-hmm. Um, again, for us, if I had a thousand dollars and and a bike code brand, I'd be doing product to give away. Yeah, because I can do social, but my account's small. Mm-hmm. I'm only going to get X amount of reach. But if I give that product to a hundred people who have got decent size reach, I'm getting a far more reach than what I'm getting just on mine. Yeah. So, man, um, don't be afraid of guerrilla marketing. Like, I, I love that shit and, and right to this day. Well, it's something you've always been really good at is networking. Is that a, a big part of that? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, my, ne- I guess, networking, I was able to get shred into a lot of bicycle stores and a lot of motorcycle stores because of the relationships I had from back through my Fox days. Yeah. And they were stoked to hear from me and they were stoked to give it a try. And, and, you know, some stores, most stores kept it, some didn't, but it definitely helped. And, um, you know, we're still in over 300 stores today because I think... You're in 300 stores? Yeah. Wow, awesome. Yeah, across That's bicycle really and moto. And um, we have got product in South America, Japan, New Zealand too. So it's... Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, really and good. it's purely through networking. Like the South yeah. America deal come around because he's a Fox distributor. He's a friend of mine over there. The New Zealand deal gotcha. is the Fox distributor in New Zealand. Um, Takashi Katsuya helped me get it into Japan. Yeah. So again, Smart. you know, a guy I used to look after back in the day, he's still a good friend of mine. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. You know, the best bit of advice I've ever been given by anyone was John O'Porter. Yeah. And he said, you have to use the people you know. Yeah. And when I say that to a lot of people, they think you're using, as in you're using your friend, you know, for your benefit. But don't be afraid to use the people you know. Yeah, I gotcha. And ever since that day, he said that, um, I'll use the people I know to, to help me because I know along the, along the way I've helped them and, and what goes around comes around. And 
like it's as cliche as anything, but good things happen to good people and um, don't be afraid to ask for help and, and, and use those people that, that you've helped along the way. And, yep. and you know, it's, it's definitely helped me with most things in my life. Yeah, it's awesome. It actually reminds me of a bit of advice I got once. It was that your best sponsors will be the ones that you're best friends with, mm-hmm. basically. So you've got to have a good relationship. It can't just strictly be business and about numbers and it's got to be somewhat of a, a friendship. It's funny you say that though, because a lot of time you think you're sponsoring a kid or a person you're best mates with, but the second they go somewhere else, they'll drop you like a fucking hot potato. <laughs> that's, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> that's yeah. that's uh, human first, athlete second. Yeah, I mean, that that's happened a lot. You just get used to that and that's okay. You can't be best friends with everyone. Yeah. But there are people, you know, that kind of find, kind of feel that, you know, if I was going to, if the people I sponsored over the years, I'm still friends with, I am, but... The close ones, I was friends with them before that anyway. Yeah. Like Boydie, for example. Look out that window. You know, he's my neighbor. That's just yeah. by chance. We're neighbors. But we've been, you know, best friends since we were t- 12 years old. I think we first met. Um, and we were friends all the way through our junior career. And it just happened that I got a career at Monza and he was riding for CDR. And we worked together for many years. And that was so much fun. Yeah. Like so much fun. If I couldn't be that guy, I was so happy to be doing that bit I was doing. Um, and then, you know, he went to another team and was wearing fly, I think for Honda or Thor, whatever it was. Um, but we were still friends and now, you know, we're, I'm not in that, that space or I'm back in that space, but I'm not, you know, in that kind of role and he's not racing and we're still, you know, really good friends. Our wives are great, you know, best friends. Our, our kids go to school together, my daughter and, and Harla and his son, Brooklyn, go to school together they drive to school together i mean they don't even use fucking front doors they just jump the fences here yeah. <laughs> it's like it's amazing so you know and, and it's not just boy like that um there's quite a, a few that i've kept in touch with and i'm still really good friends with so it's pretty cool yeah that's awesome no i definitely agree with that you um like i'm not sure what it's like for you but if you look at your friend circle most of them will be from what your career is you'll have a few from school but the majority would be. I, I've got one person that I talk to from school. I'm about the same. Yeah. Yeah. So then if you're going through your career with the mentality of the one year deals burn them at the end, then it's probably, it's not going to work out too well towards the end. Like no, the relationships really, no. are a long, lot longer than the I year. mean, they, and they don't all work out great too. You know, I've had guys where I've said as some things too. And at the time I was like, whatever. And, and I'm sure they th- would have left that conversation with me thinking I was a fucking idiot. And then, you know, down the track now, I'm like, fuck, if I had said that to someone or if someone had said that to me, I would have thought they were a fucking idiot too. I mean, there's plenty, not plenty of it. There's definitely a few instances where young and egos and and bits and pieces (laughs) and you say some silly things. And um, I mean, uh, I could think of maybe one or two times if I could change what I said to someone back in those days, I probably would. So, I mean, it's not too bad with one or two times, but yeah. Um, it's not always, yeah, it's, it's a, it's always a two, it's a two way street or, um, you know, it hasn't worked out with people, you know, dropping me like a hot potato when they've gone brands. But then again, there's some people who I haven't kept in touch with because I had no interest with. Yeah. You do have to connect on a personal level at some degree to, yeah. to want to continue it on. Yeah. 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 Um, got nothing against the guy at all right now but Dan Reardon was a someone I could never gel with yep um, really struggled Dan's been copying it on my shows lately oh has he really I mean get, again <laughs> oh, I'm that boss ag- again <laughs> I've got um, oh yeah right <laughs> <laughs> yeah see there's another one I so you're fucking not gonna... lo- you know there's another guy I absolutely love and we, M- M- Mossy is, is an interesting story right because we we'd known each other for such a long time like since him and him and Jake were 10 or 11 I looked after him for a while with Shift, and then when he went to Alps, we had like this Fox versus Alps thing going on. And then one time it was, it was on a forum, full full noise forum. We all oh, had to do nice. our predictions, and I didn't put him inside my top three, and he fucking roasted me for it. <laughs> and he ended up crashing that year and missing out, and I made it fuck it, well aware that I said, hey, look at me top three. Yeah, you're not in there and are you in there now and it was like this thing it was really weird and I hadn't spoke to him for many years and then when I started at AME last year I got a call from Baden 
to yeah. say that, you know, Mossy wasn't included in the opening ceremonies last year and he should have been. He got second in the championship, only just missed out, but he wasn't a factory guy, so he missed out. So I made a promise, like, he should have been in part of that. Yeah. So I made a promise to Matt and Baden that Mossy would be a part of everything. Um, and even though he um, went to Empire that um, he was a factory guy, but we're still making sure we did the Ben Tracer episode. Like we made sure it was, a, and we reconnected. Yeah. And it feels like it never changed from back when he was a 10 year old and I was like a 15 year old kid. Yeah. Awesome. All those early days of Monza, like oh, I've got so much time for Matt now. And it's, it's um, just funny how it all works out and, yep. and how that, that one played out. I really love that guy. I'm stoked to see what he's doing. Um, Australian Supercross, World Supercross, you know, killing it in India. He just wrapped up the championship today. Yeah. Um, like how it's just so good to see him back out there, and yeah, it's it's pretty funny how that one rolled out. It is awesome. I just I did a show of him a few episodes ago, and yeah, he, um, I brought it up to him. I said, "You've gone from like the most hated to now I went to Newcastle Supercross, mm-hmm. most loved. He had the biggest cheers by 100%. far." And it was it's just an interesting contrast because what you mentioned there, he had the rivalry with Fox and Alps. He would basically do that on purpose just to motivate him. But if you got past the face and the cover and the shield, it was he's just a genuinely nice guy down yeah. the bottom. No, he is. It's, um, is, um, it's really interesting cool. to hear you had the same, same sort of thing. Yeah. So working with the WSX mm. and OzSX, how's that? Going good. I got touched on earlier. Um, <clears throat> Australian Supercross has got a lot of momentum and I think we just need to prove it a little bit. Yeah, we cop a bit of heat online about you know, three rounds, how can you be a championship with three rounds? But, and you know what? Before I was at AME, I was one of those people saying that. Same. Now I know the ins and outs of what's going on and we're back in that rebuilding phase and AME are taking on every round in house rather than separate motors, promoters. It's just gonna build, like I said, man, we did three great races last year. Um, and the feedback we got was great because you hear straight away is something's not right. Yeah. But from, and I, I'm not talking any shit, from everyone we got amazing feedback about those races we put on awesome the manufacturers the conversations we're having with all the manufacturers and the team now are stoked with what we're doing um we got a lot of momentum um like i said this year uh we're close to finishing our calendar it's going to be the four or five rounds but one of those rounds is going to be well i mean all of them are going to be epic one of them is going to be huge yeah um just with where we're going to take it and i can't tell you but it'll come out um pretty soon so that's going to be really cool and then you know we're going to go to five or six rounds and like i said to you before six rounds is kind of where it's at yeah so we're really happy with the team we have um, we're all passionate about it we all love it we can't wait to see this thing grow to exactly where it needs to be and that's that six rounds but not just have six rounds these are going to be six epic races you know our last year um our mission statement for australian supercross was bring back the best of Supercross. Um, in you know, in my opinion, some of those best days of Supercross were the 90s with Phil Christensen, the spokes promotions, spokes the Supercross yep. Masters. So every decision we made or spoke about, um, every decision we had to make or any conversation we had, it went back to, hey, I'll be bringing back the best of Supercross with this decision. Yeah, cool. Um, you know, and before I started, you know, uh, it wasn't, and it's not just me, but in 22 with the multiple promoters, there was a lot of things said and they didn't deliver them. Whether that was AME or the other promoters, it's not blaming anyone, but last year I said, hey, if we say we're going to do something, we have to do it like 100%. And I was really proud and that That's we did that. That's brand reputation. We, and we did. And it was really recognized. Um, and really appreciate it. And we're going into that this year. You know, our mission statement this year is more than a race. Yep. Sounds pretty cliche, right? But we have to give our customers, being the riders, the teams, the privateers, an experience that's far more than a race. Right from um, knowing who to talk to every single time to the where they are allocated in the pit party to how they're included at press day the content they're getting through our social channels, the getting involved in opening ceremonies right through to the podium experience. We're giving every single rider more than a race. Um, And on the other hand, it also reflects on our customers being the people who buy tickets. 
it's got to be more than just a race from them. They've got to have the most memorable night they've ever had from the moment they get there with the pit party. I mean, you saw that in Newcastle. I saw you walking around um, right through to when they go into the opening ceremony. Like, we've elevated that opening ceremony. It feels like a US race now. We've got the voiceover. Yep. We've got the guys riding out with the flags over their shoulders. It's a full show, full production now. Right yep. through to the <clears throat> racing, to the podium, the fireworks at the end. It's much more than a race. So this is totally off topic. Are you familiar with Simon Beard? No. He was the founder of Culture Kings. Oh yeah. So he sold it for 600 million. But it's a really interesting, he has some information out there and some books and stuff that you can read. And I, I recommend you do, but he talks about basically exactly what you just said. It's that the, that experience is like that dopamine drive. They want to come, they want to feel good. That it wants to be a, like exciting. And that was, what, that was how he built Culture Kings. Was when you come into Culture Kings, there's loud music, there's games, mm-hmm. there's entertaining things going on. And, yeah. and that gave that culture and that vibe. And it was like a, a, basically like a dopamine hit for the customer to come yeah, there, was, there was no other store like Culture Kings was there. When you walk in, instead of being really brightly lit, the place is black. Yeah, well, that was all by design. Like he even um, employed like some scientists about the dopamine feedback loop and how do I give these customers like the best experience possible so they're like, it's more than a shop, it's more than yeah. a brand, it's, it's an experience. He 100% did that. Well, it's really interesting because it kind of sounds like that's what you're trying to go from just a race to yeah, the experience. Yeah, no, it's so. definitely more than a race. So like I said, every, every conversation we have, every decision we make with this championship now, we, are we doing this? Are we giving, you know, is it more than a race? Are we doing it for the right reasons? Yeah. So we're on a really good path, got a great team. I'm really excited about Australian Supercross and where it's going to go. I mean, I feel like we've got a bit of a point to prove. I think we proved a lot of it last year, but um, we still have um, to, you know, points to prove to a few more people. I think we've got to prove a few people wrong who may just think we're another promoter come and go, and that's totally right because you know, well, they're totally okay to think that because there's been lots of promoters come and go. So why wouldn't they think that? And we've just got to prove them wrong. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So we'll go back to, I want to talk on the moving parts of running a Supercross event because you touched on the criticism, which people are totally entitled to her opinion. And I was one of these people in the past. Mm -hmm. But now running businesses and and looking behind the scenes and you see all the magnitude of things that are going on from the schedules to the logistics to the finances, just to absolutely everything. What's that like running a Supercross event? Because I... I sort of compare that to say you watch Taylor Swift come or Ed Sheeran mm. to compete in, uh, to sorry, perform in the MCG. They've got a generic stage they carry around and that's it. There's no competitors. There's no um, fair, like clean up. There's none of this stuff. It's a much. So that's what you think, man. The logistics of a concert like that would be fucking huge. What about like the track build and stuff like that? Oh, for sure. There's yeah. different elements and different challenges, but they still have challenges. Yeah. Imagine trying to get 100,000 people in and out of that Taylor Swift concert. Yeah. Like the challenges they would have to put that on and the people and the resources they would have to to get uh, would be massive. But what about cost-wise? Um, cost-wise would still be would be there, I guess. But I think, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what it costs to put on a concert like that. I know what it costs for us to put a Supercross race on. Yeah. And again, I, I kind of, like I said to you before, Supercross races here to run and no cheaper by any means to put on in the US and they're getting you know 35,000 week in week out yeah we'd love to get that it'd make it um, a far less stressful for our you know for our, for our team and for Bailey and Cal who, who own AME yeah so um, but you know it's still we wouldn't be here doing it if we if it wasn't if it was losing money every round some races do but but some earn good money so it's you know it's just that balance well, just in your personal opinion, do you see the sport growing past where it is now? Like double, triple, quadruple the size? Uh, what do you mean triple? Like as in... Cr- crowd attendance, participation. I guess the whole thing. So let's go crowd attendance, entries, no. bike sales, just the whole sport of motorcycling. Can it ever grow to a level? Like say oh. what the UFC has done, it's gone from a low level to massive. I Could think, it, I think it'll grow. I mean, we saw that in participation last year. You know, round one in 2022, there was 41 riders for the whole event yep. round one in 23 we had 130 um you know a huge part of that was the reintroduction of the 85 class and i mean that was a strategy to get more riders behind the gates in sx1 and sx2 in four years time because you know those guys lining up in sx1 and sx2 now 
they were kind of aging out and there was not a lot of new kids coming through because they hadn't started riding supercross at 10 and 12. They haven't had the opportunity. So we've got to get these kids riding supercross earlier. So in four or five years time, those premium or premier classes are full again. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and I'm confident it's gonna happen. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'm so stoked that you did that. I've always been pretty vocal about the overseas riders, which is totally well and good. But when most of the factory rides go to overseas, it probably is a little bit uninspiring to the kids that aren't really getting a go and then... Well, then, yeah, but the kids haven't had a go because they've had no opportunity to have a go. There's been no Supercross yeah, championship for them to race. Yeah. They've had no reason for the dads to go out and spend, you know, 20 grand on a track or whatever a track costs these days in your backyard. Yeah. Why would they? But now there's a reason to do that and we're going to start building young Supercross champions again. I think there was a whole generation of rider that missed out on racing Supercross. They must have been a good nearly 10 years there. They didn't have juniors at, yep. at Supercross. Exactly. So, you know, we'll, that SX3 class is, is um, pretty strong and it's going to get stronger. But I really want to see those SX3 kids stepping up to SX2 or SX1 sooner um, and really using the SX3 as that development class to get into the, the premier classes. And um, the only way we can do that is getting them riding younger and that 85 class, you know, starting at 12 is, you know, perfect platform for them. Awesome. Unreal. Unreal. We'll segue off again. Southside crew. Yeah. What's in the water? <laughs> I've got to go through a list of names here. You've got your brother Cam, first ever to do a double backflip. You got Bill. No, Cam. he wasn't. Travis. Wasn't? Travis was the first one. Ah, my bad. Was he first one to do it in competition? Uh, first one to do it in an actual freestyle run, not best actual trick. freestyle. But run. But he's probably done more than than anyone. So hey, he's won't. probably most known for it. I'm going to say. Yep. Yep. So we got Cam. Yep. Everyone knows Bilko, Cade Mosey, mm-hmm. Brent Lamman, Neighbor Shane Boyd, Adam Bailey, Michael Norris, Josh Kasia, Chase Mosey. There's a ton more. If you added up all the achievements of everyone there from like a small little area, what's the go with that? Yeah, when you sent through... My friend group's not that cool. I mean, when you sent through your que- those questions and I saw that, I thought, yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Um, the first thing that come to mind for me is nothing that's in the water. I think it's the opportunities our parents created for us. Yep. Um, you look at that list and yeah, I think of all that all of our parents created every opportunity we had. Um, probably Bailey with the exception. I mean, his parents were around a lot for sure and, and I love his parents, but they didn't really go to the races and, and with him or whatever. But I think it's, yeah, just purely, we wouldn't be here doing what we're doing and have the friendship that we do if it wasn't for our parents giving us the opportunity. And man, I promise you, like I, try and replicate what my parents did for me with my kids. I mean, I've always told dad straight to his face. I said, if I could give my kids half the childhood you gave me and Cam, I'll be stoked. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Uh, um, so I think that's what it is. I mean, I think we all work hard. We all, uh, we're all driven. Because um, to give context, you all live within like two minutes of each other. Pretty we much. all used to. Used to? Not so much anymore. Like we're all pretty spread out now. Yeah. Um, you know, Bailey's on the Gold Coast and... Cade's in South Australia somewhere now. You They're know. all at some point, like, lived but, in. Oh, man, with some point, you know, back when we were, you know, teenagers and all the way through early, you know, young adults. It's it was kind of crazy. Within, within, all within <laughs> two Ks. There was going to be global businesses there. There was going to be champions. Or, yeah. I yeah. mean, we all feed off each other and and are happy for each other and, and wants, want what's best for each other. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know why. I'm sure there's lots of friendship groups out there who are successful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just think that we were real lucky and fortunate of kids to have the, the childhood we did and traveling the, the, the country together, you know, for many years, you know, the best part of 10, 15 years as kids and growing up as best friends and doing it all. I think that's why we're all still pretty close. And your relationship with Cam? Yeah, it's good. Um, um, yeah. Uh, it's, I'm sure you know, butt heads like brothers always do. Of course we do. do. <laughs> of course we do, man. He gives me the shits. Um, <laughs> I give him the shits. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, but I know I'm still the first person he'll call when something goes wrong, you know, um, and and vice versa. So, you know, we are, we're only 18 months apart. Our kids are, uh, you know, they're 
cousins, but they're also really good friends. Um, Brooke and Christy get along great and we have for a long time, but you know, we're super close. Um, yeah, you know, as family, it always shit happens sometimes and we'll have a blue here and there, but it'll always be okay. And, and I know that, um, you know, if I ever needed something or something happened to me, he'd be the first person I would call. Yeah. And I, I know it'd be the other way around. Yep. Yep. Awesome, mate. Well, that pretty well wraps up. Yeah. Maybe cool. we'll finish up there. All right. Awesome. So we did say what goes around comes around. I did get you a gift. You didn't need to do that, mate. As you were my first ever sponsor. <laughs> and then I reached out out of the blue and you were happy to sit down. So. Okay, now. All yours, mate. Jesus Christ. I know you're a whiskey kind of I am. I definitely am. Very yeah. nice. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that. No, no worries. You didn't need to do that, though. Pleasure. I know when you said, oh, I'm happy to pay me for my time, I'm like, fuck, don't be stupid. No, I'm like, um, I, don't know, I don't know anyone who would take you up on that, but I'm happy to do it. It's cool to see you having a crack. Cheers, mate. I like no, the content it. you put out. It's, um, you definitely get everyone talking. Even, the, like I said, the Lawrence brothers brought you up. Yeah, right. Well, Hunter did anyway. Yeah. He, he watched the Mossy one and it oh, said, cool. he said, fuck, I actually made me want to come. I feel like for the first time in a long time, it's made me want to go home. Yeah. Yeah. So you're definitely, That's you know, awesome. if he's watching, yeah, though, I mean, everyone's watching. Yeah, I mean, what you're doing, I'm so. sure they're watching the guests, not me, but yeah, I do appreciate it. Oh, no? Yeah. No, you'll create the opportunities. No worries, mate. Cool. So one of the riders I left out of the Southside crew is the late Jay Archer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know what to say there, mate, but I give my condolences and you guys had a, had a close relationship. Yeah, it's been a fucking tough week, really, you know. Um, I don't know what to say. I got that. I got that phone call. I was, I was in a meeting at work, and Cam called me, and I couldn't answer it. He called me straight away. I couldn't answer it. He called me again. I'm like fuck, what's? I said I'm in a meeting. I'll call you back. Um, on my way home. And he said, call me ASAP. And I just wrote back, what's happened? And he goes, need to talk. I'm like, okay. He's saying good. <laughs> so I left the meeting and I answered the, and called him. And yeah, he told me what happened and I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it was, took a long, it took a while to sink in. I mean, it still really hasn't sunk in. I haven't been around the family since it happened. I mean, I sp messaged Tracy and Carly, you know, that afternoon on the Wednesday when it happened. And um, that was Wednesday. I kind of let the family work everything out. I know Cam and Brooke have been working really hard and supporting the family and, and we're just, you know, being there wherever we can. I, I went away on the weekend with Hudson for a downhill race and that, I had no service and everything. So I um, I guess it was almost a bit of a distraction, but then, you know, you get back last night and, and it really hits home again. Like, you know, you see all the tributes come through and yeah, it was, it's so fucking sad, mate. I mean, I will never say, you know, you go out doing what you love because I, you know, a lot of people have said that and I don't think that's right because, fuck, there's, there's no nice thing about it, you know. Yeah, he did go out doing what he loved, but that doesn't make it any easier or any better or any nicer for anyone. So I don't really, I can't really relate to that saying. We're going to miss him a lot. I mean, he, I remember... J.O. is a, a young kid. I think I met J.O. like the first time I kind of, around the same time I met Mossy. He would have been, I don't know how old he was back then. Five, six, eight maybe. He was he was young. Um, and yet definitely always been around him. I haven't been as close to him as what Cam has. Um, well, Brooke, Cam was almost like a father figure to him. Um, and it really, it's really rocked him hard. Um, it's been, I mean, it's rocked everyone hard. Um, it's been horrible, but it's going to be sad. You know, that guy wanted that triple flip more than anyone and he, and he did it and he, he nailed it at Nitro Games and he's just pushing the limits and I mean, yeah, it's just, it's really sad. I, I think it's just a little accident. He, it wasn't, definitely wasn't skill or anything like that. It wasn't mechanical. It was just something, a freak accident that was... You know, that's happened and it's it's heartbreaking and we're going to miss him a lot. Um, you're going to gonna miss, you know, the larrikin that I remember J.O. as. I don't remember J.O. as the, the the badass freestyle guy. I just remember him as the kid, the larrikin. Um, you know, my son and his nephew are amazing. They, they, they're good friends. They've been friends since they were born. And uh, the relationship J.O. had with, with Ryder and... 
um, and London. Like he was an amazing uncle. That Archer family, uh, as close as I've, as I've ever seen any family. So my heart breaks for them. Um, and you know Cam and Brooke as well. So it's just yeah, really sad and definitely gonna miss him. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, and I totally echo what you said. I thought something that was so amazing about Jay was on the biggest night of his life, landing the triple flip. He dedicated it to Marini's fiance, to, to engaging best, yeah. his fiance. Yeah, and I just thought that was so commendable for a man on when it's all about him and here he goes making it about someone else, his partner. Yeah. I thought yeah. that was just encompassed him so well. Yeah, no, that's just how he was. He was um, very selfless and um, I wasn't. He wasn't, you know, the the guy who had to make it all about him. He made it all about everyone and that's why he was pretty special. You know, there's a lot of athletes like that who do make it all about them no matter the situation they're in. Yeah. Whether it's at a stadium in front of, you know, 50,000 people or at a barbecue with new friends, they've got to make it all about them. A lot of athletes or some athletes are like that and he's definitely not. Um, I think, you know, if you took Jay to a barbecue uh, with all new people, you would leave that barbecue probably not knowing what he did and how big of a deal he was and how special he was and how talented he was. You know, he wasn't that type of guy. So, uh, yeah, we're going to miss him a lot. And it's fucking an absolute devast, you know, devastation for all of us and our, our, our crew and the whole industry, not just our crews, for everyone. But, you know, like I said, my heart is just completely shattered for his family and his mum. You know, his mum was the, the most important person to him and vice versa. J.O. was everything to, to Trace and... It's just absolutely devastating. Awesome, mate. I appreciate that. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Guys. All good. No worries.